Uh, welcome okay. everyone. Uh, uh, good, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, Asia uh, Asia graphics uh, uh, the 20th I think this is the 20th sem uh, seminar of the Asia graphics. So uh, tonight we are uh, we're glad to uh, invite two uh, speakers uh, to share their uh, fascinating works with us. The first one is uh, Professor Yue Yong Hong. Uh, Professor Yue Yong Hong is uh, 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 he, uh, his talk title is Simulating Complex Flows for Foods and Painterly Drawings. Uh, professor Yu Yong Hao is a, is a professor leading the computer graphics lab at Department of Integrated Information Technology, Aoyama Gakuin University. And before joining AGU, he worked at the University of Tokyo and Columbia University. He received his PhD in, in Information Science and Technology in 2011 from the University of Tokyo. His research interests lie uh, primary, uh, primarily in the mathematics side of computer graphics covering physically based simulation and design. Let's welcome his talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk at uh, Asia Graphics Web Seminar. Um, so there's an uh, ancient uh, Greek phrase um, called uh, panther, right? Pantry means everything flows. <clears throat> so if you look at our surroundings, you will find clouds or uh, water. These are some standard fluids. And uh, there are some other types of complex uh, behavior fluids, like maybe some of you already had dinner, so maybe you had some food. And uh, I, I hope um, you don't feel hungry if you haven't had dinner yet. And maybe you had some dumplings, uh, some drinks and uh, desserts, right? So there are a bunch of different types of um, complex fluids around us. And uh, in the uh, physics community, there was a paper about on the rheology of cats and uh, the author uh, got a Ig Nobel Prize in physics in 2017. Um, it's about the deformation of the cats can be viewed as a form of fluid. So uh, literally everything um, flows. And uh, maybe some of you have watched this um, uh, YouTube video. Uh, it's about pitch drop. Pitch is like an, an uh, almost like a, a solid material, but uh, it has a very high viscosity. Uh, it's like the uh, asphalt uh, used to make our roads. And uh, if, if you spend a very long time um, uh, observing it, you will see that there will be like kind of drop forming. <clears throat> it takes three years, right? So every everything flows. And you can also see complex flows in uh, paintings. Like this is an art piece by uh, Vincent van Gogh called Starry Night. You see these um, curved uh, strokes. <clears throat> so today's talk, I will introduce um, uh, some part of uh, our work about simulating the complex um, fluids, like some foods, and also um, some design or uh, em the, the emulation of um, human drawn, drawing paintings. <clears throat> so let's get started from the um, physically based simulation of complex fluids. Uh, we will be focusing on a particular class of fluids called shear dependent fluids like the cream or shaving cream, um, oil, oil uh, paintings, our blood or other types of uh, materials. <clears throat> so here you are seeing uh, a shaving cream attached to a plate and I'm um, uh, shaking the plate on the top. Then at the beginning, the um, shaving cream start to um, behave like an uh, elastic material, but soon it will start to flow and there will be a sudden uh, rapid flow occurring then there will be a material tear and on tip of the material. <clears throat> so unlike water, um, the stiff peak will stay there. That's some um, <clears throat> very interesting behavior of this type of shear dependent fluids. Familiar with the equation of motion. And the important thing is that we need to uh, <clears throat> specify the constitutive law to model the particular uh, fluid, uh, the physics behavior of the material. 
So here's an, a schematic view of the um, shaving cream we have seen just so far. Uh, if so, so basically here is your material and you're applying the force here. And if the force is weak, then after you release the force, then the material will go back to its original state. And this is the elastic deformation. But uh, if the force is larger, then the molecules will slide over each other. And uh, after you release the force, then the material will never return to its original state. And this is called plastic flow. <clears throat> so basically, we need to um, model uh, the degree of deformation. And for that, um, for convenience, uh, usually we consider two different frames uh, for the material. One is a reference frame or the material frame. Um, describing some rest state, and then uh, the current frame uh, describing the current position. And uh, these two frames are representing the same material. So basically, um, for any given point in the reference frame, you can find its corresponding point in the current frame. So there is a uh, placement map relating uh, these two positions, right? Then um, with this placement map, you can compute its derivative, then you get the correspondence between the tangent vectors, I mean, these little arrows um, leaving the points, right? Then you can have the correspondence between these um, little arrows, then you know uh, which direction gets how much stretching, something like that. <clears throat> and this deformation gradient is basically, um, I mean, frankly speaking, it's uh, describing the ratio of the deformation and uh, is a kind of unitless quantity. <clears throat> Then on a, because we want to um, uh, deal with the plasticity, uh, we decompose the deformation into the plastic part and the elastic part. <clears throat> the plastic part is volume preserving and uh, basically it uh, uh, describes the new rest state. And uh, the elasticity is measured by between the new rest state and the current state. So you have this multiplicative decomposition. <clears throat> then by making use of the elastic part of the deformation gradient, we um, define some strain measure. <clears throat> the well-known uh, measures are, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> uh, the well-known measures are uh, right Cauchy green tensor and left Cauchy green tensor. And because we want to deal with rate dependent plasticity, um, uh, we prefer to use the left Cauchy green tensor because it's it has a frame in, in uh, difference, even under um, the rate dependency. <clears throat> and uh, this strain measure is, again, um, frankly speaking, it's, it's, it's like on the ratio of deformation and the unitless quantity. <clears throat> then um, to model the elasticity, um, recently people use hyperelasticity, uh, meaning that we start by uh, defining the so-called st stored or strain energy density. And then the stress can be derived based on this um, energy density. And for this energy density, we say uh, we have some mathematical formula for the isotropic volume change part and uh, the shear part. The isotropic volume change is that um, um, you have some uh, forces applied uniformly to the material, so it, it gets um, it's changing the volume. Then once it has the change in the volume, how much um, response it sh should have. That, that's describing something like that. And um, besides the isotropic volume change, there is another type of deformation, which is like you push the material in one direction and stretch it in the other direction. So this way you can um, keep its volume, but uh, change its shape, right? This is called shear deformation. So basically you define um, the energy for these two changes, right? Then you get the stress. <clears throat> and uh, to deal with plasticity, uh, you further on top of that apply a yield condition. And you say that uh, when the shear stress exceeds some threshold, meaning that your uh, shear stress is too large, then you say the elasticity cannot um, sustain the object anymore. And then there will, some be, there will be some flow occurring. <clears throat> and that threshold is called yield stress. Then uh, once, yield, uh, when, once that yielding is happening, 
then your shear stress will be the yield stress plus some excess stress. And uh, this excess, ex excess stress comes from this uh, viscosity. <clears throat> and there are different models for this. Uh, the um, simplest one is to use a uh, scalar coefficient uh, and multiply it with the strain rate, where strain rate is the, um, uh, how do I say? Yeah, if you have a velocity profile like this, and uh, the velocity depends on location, then there will be a velocity gradient happening, right? Then um, that means um, your neighbor moves differently from you. And then the viscosity says that uh, if your neighbor moves differently from you, then the viscosity force will try to equalize the, um, your neighboring, your motion with your neighboring. Um, then that, that's the emergence of the viscosity. So basically, um, based on the uh, velocity gradient, uh, which is the strain rate, then you times the uh, viscosity quotient, then you get the excess stress here. And if you look at the velocity gradient, it's uh, the uh, velocity uh, divided by the position. So you have a uh, unit of uh, um, second inverse. So that's why you see on the dots on top of this symbol gamma here. Uh, so it, it indicates this is indeed a an, uh, quantity of uh, rate. <clears throat> and uh, with this, you have the elasticity, the yield stress, and the viscosity. Then you can write uh, an, a schematic view like this uh, for your uh, visco elast uh, viscoelastoplastic material. And uh, if we go back to the schematic view of the um, deformation here, uh, when the force is small, then you only have the spring working. And uh, when the force is larger, then uh, your yield condition is violated and your uh, dashboard or your viscosity start to uh, play a role. <clears throat> okay. Now, if you plug in the viscoplasticity uh, model with the yield stress, and this um, uh, viscosity term, then you see that, uh, um, well, you can somehow model this flow, but uh, the flow is not something like that you see from this um, captured footage, where the captured footage, it flows very rapidly at some point, but your flow in the simulation is kind of uh, slow um, at any time, right? And uh, there is this model called the Hershelbach model, where you have an additional power in here. And by just adding this new parameter, then you can start to match up your simulation with the cap captured footage. So uh, the bottom is the um, captured footage and on the top, you see the simulation. And you see that at the beginning, it behaves like an uh, uh, elastic material. And then there is a sudden flow happening here and you can pretty much uh, match up the their um, motion. It works very nicely. And here is a side-by-side -side comparison between the videos. You see that it starts to slow, uh, it starts to flow at exactly the same time. <clears throat> then, um, so to understand more about the harsh Bakri model, uh, you can we can um, think about what is the effective viscosity. Uh, the viscosity is defined as the ratio between the excess stress and the uh, strain rate, right? So then uh, for the harsher Barclay model, you can um, compute the same ratio between the excess stress and the uh, strain rate. Then, um, although this formula uh, looks like very complex, uh, the point is that it's now a um, excess stress dependent quantity. So if you plot that into a graph like this, and uh, you, you draw the excess stress in this uh, horizontal axis, and uh, you put the effective viscosity in the vert vertical axis, uh, axis then uh, you see that if you set the power um, to the power n to one, you recover the viscoplastic relation where um, the viscosity is a constant irrespective of the excess stress. And by setting n smaller than one, you recover the shear thinning behavior. 
where uh, if you apply large forces, then the material flows easily. And on the opposite, if you uh, specify n larger than one, then you recover the shear thickening behavior, where if you apply larger force, then, then the material flows um, doesn't flow that much. <clears throat> And also the Herschel Barclay uh, model covers a, a wide class of materials uh, and it includes <clears throat> the viscoplastic model or Bingham model and the power model, power law model and the Newtonian fluid as its subclasses. The Newtonian fluids are the model for water or air or something like that. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> by, by just setting, for example, n to one and u thrust to zero, then you get the Newtonian fluid. Uh, model. <clears throat> okay, then for simulation, we use material point method. Uh, basically, you have a bunch of particles, and each particle carries some physical quantities like uh, position, velocity, uh, the deformation states, uh, something like that. Then you also use a background grid. Uh, first, you transfer the information from particle side to grid, then you compute force. Then uh, you update the particle uh, velocity, then advect the particles, then the cycle goes on, right? <clears throat> With this uh, framework, um, it's very easy to implement the complex material behavior because you can um, impose the material behavior at each point. And what you have to do is uh, just to implement this so-called plastic flow rule. <clears throat> where it, it's about a rule of how you update the strain measure. Uh, basically, you have the elastic prediction part, meaning that the deformation uh, state just go with the flow. And then on top of that, you have some plastic correction <clears throat> uh, because of this um, um, permanent flow, right? Of, I mean, the, the uh, some elastic uh, part will flow into the plastic part. So there will be a permanent um, deformation. <clears throat> and this plastic correction will be uh, defined by the uh, minus, uh, the, the negative of the flow rate times some flow direction. So if, if you implement this, then you can generate a bunch of complex behavior fluids. <clears throat> so here are some examples. The first one is the uh, small example. Uh, it's a uniform material. Uh, well, when, when you lift the cracker, then you see that there will be a, a stiff peak form formed on, on the tip of the bottom part. <clears throat> and you can also do uh, two layer s'mores where you have an uh, outer <clears throat> um, uh, layer and uh, it cracks and you see the inner comes out. <clears throat> you can also do pythos. Again, you see the stiff peak formed here. <clears throat> and uh, here we also did some experiments uh, for, <clears throat> for our lab members. And uh, here are some simulations. Uh, we couldn't do too many to, to Keenan. So uh, we did a, uh, instead did a lot of uh, simulations using different material parameters. You see that uh, by changing the material parameters, you have like fluid like high toss, some cottage cheese like ones, and some very elastic ones. <clears throat> and we also did some real high toss to all of the authors, something like this. Uh, we use this uh, clip as our fast forward. And a few years later, I got a chance to get this uh, device called the Reometer, uh, where you can accurately measure the flowing behavior of different materials. And we did the measurement. Uh, here, the dots are measured the data, and uh, it's plotted for the shear rate against the measured shear stress. <clears throat> then, um, we found, we found that uh, we could uh, uh, nicely uh, fit the measured data using the harsher barker model. And uh, you see it covers honey, mayo, some syrup, ketchup, uh, hot chili sauce, 
and then smear um, the pork cutlet sauce, mustard, and so on, right? <clears throat> it's very nice. Then uh, on YouTube, we also found this video. Uh, it, it's about human mixing different sauces to make up a new sauce. We do this frequently for cooking, right? And then we mix up the materials. And here is the new sauce, right? Then uh, if you look at the video, you, you will notice that um, um, the behavior of the material is kind of very different um, when you mix, mix them up, right? <clears throat> so then we wanted to model this and we started doing an uh, experiment by uh, mixing the honey and mayo. And for honey, uh, you see uh, it has a high viscosity, so it doesn't flow that much. And for mayo, it has a high yield stress, so it also doesn't flow that much. Then the question is, what about their mixtures? And interestingly, although honey and mayo don't flow that much, but their uh, mixtures uh, flows faster than both of them. It's, it's very interesting. And if you look at different mixing ratios, uh, the intermediate mixing ratios, they also flow faster, right? It's very interesting. <clears throat> then we thought whether we can reproduce this material, uh, this behavior using just the standard quantum simulation. Uh, so one possibility is to say we have two different kinds of particles and we put them together. We have honey and mayo um, together. Then working on the mass, we know we notice that uh, by doing this way, we will end up having uh, viscosity, effect viscosity. That's a linear blending of the original viscosity of the two materials. Uh, it's because if we put the material together, then they will share the same uh, flow rate or strain rate. So then um, if the stress are linear uh, blended, then of course their viscosity is also linearly blended, right? <clears throat> But then using the linear blending, of course, you cannot uh, reproduce the observed uh, behavior seen in the captured footage. Um, the two, two sides flow slowly and the mixed one due to the linear blending also flows slowly. <clears throat> so why is this? So uh, if we look at the um, plot uh, of the relation between shear rate and shear stress, um, we notice that uh, there's a point, the mayo and honey will have a cross point here, right? But then their uh, blended one um, doesn't pass through this cross point. It, it, it has a lower stress. So that's why the blended one flows um, more easily. And uh, with the linear blending, you can only have an, a line, uh, something like this uh, gray line that pass through this cross point. So we need an, uh, a new way of blending the material uh, parameters, uh, the materials together. <clears throat> a model for viscosity blending. So the question is, can we uh, estimate the properties of blends from uh, only the material properties of its constituents and the mixing ratios? Uh, if we have this kind of model, then it's very easy to use. <clears throat> then looking at previous <clears throat> models, we noticed that um, uh, all of basically all of the previous models gives us a uh, prediction that will pass through this cross point, which is not good. And uh, by measuring <clears throat> the um, mixture, uh, the property of the mixtures, we notice that they can also be fitted nicely with the harsher Barclay model. So, and also for uh, more, um, uh, this is the uh, mayo honey mixture with more. Um, uh, finely divided uh, mixing ratios. You can see that they all uh, can fit it using the partial buckle model. <clears throat> so then we thought that uh, maybe there will be a model uh, that uh, will return the harsh buckle parameter for us. Then we thought about uh, some operator aspects of the blending um, operation. We start by saying that uh, uh, modeling and substance by the combination of mass and material parameters. Then uh, we say that uh, uh, the blending can be modeled, can be described using a blending operator like this. So if we have two materials blended together, you get the new material SC, right? Then if you view the blending 
using this um, operator uh, point of view, then you can think about different um, operator, uh, the law related to operators, right? Like the commutative law, associative law, distributive law, and so on. And in terms of the blending, that basically means if you have material A and B, uh, whether you put A first or whether you put B first, you should have the same result. Or if you had three materials and uh, independent of the order of the blending, you will end up with having the same material and so on. And if you um, uh, admit that these laws are reasonable, then something interesting uh, we will have. The first is there will exist a uh, blending map, meaning that the um, material parameter of the blend, blended one can be uh, written as a function of the mixing ratio and then the material parameter of the constituents. So this is a good news. And then further, this um, blending function can be written in more specific form, which is that uh, uh, there is a uh, function f that maps your material parameter to some other space. Then in that other space, you do a linear uh, blending. Then after that, you do the inverse of the function f, then you get the blended parameter. So be, be, by having some nonlinearity in this function f, uh, you can basically um, uh, realize some very complex uh, beha blending behaviors, not, not just the linear blending. Okay, then uh, the question will be how to find this function f from the measure of the data. And then by do, using some data-driven approach, we uh, designed a model like this. And with this, uh, we can recover some uh, properties that we observed uh, 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 qualitatively like this. For example, for the mayo and the honey blends, uh, the, here the dots are measured the data and the lines are the estimations using our model. You can see that our model can reproduce the fact that the, the blend doesn't pass through this cross point. And uh, you can see for other um, material pairs, uh, they will also do a good job. And with the, our model, <clears throat> the center is the recorded footage and our model, the simulation with our model is shown the bottom. You can see that there is a uh, much better matchup between the simulated one and the recorded footage, right? <clears throat> and for other uh, brands, you also have a better matchup. And we can also do a brands for three materials. <clears throat> and here's some application for theory dips. You have mayo dip here and honey dip here. Then here's the branded one using our model. And uh, you can also do some continuous blending like this. So, so without blending, uh, the two materials flow like this. Then with some blending and our uh, nonlinear blending, you see that uh, you have like faster flow <clears throat> uh, because the mixed one uh, flow, uh, flows easier. <clears throat> And you can also do some sauce on a uh, steak. <clears throat> here's the Japanese pork cutlet sauce and here's barbecue sauce. You can see the coiling motion and then with the blended one, you see faster flow and, but with the coiling motion. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Then I think uh, I will move on to the uh, flows in painting drawings. And um, so our motivation was this um, animation. Uh, it's uh, a clip from the film Loving Vincent uh, by Breakthrough Films and Trademark Films in uh, 2017. So you see that uh, there is like a, um, a human drawing like style um, here, right? And then uh, this um, film was created by uh, manual painting by uh, more than 50 artists uh, drawn for more than um, 60,000 frames, I think. So it, it's pre pretty um, uh, work uh, labor intensive. So uh, we thought maybe we, 
if, if it would be nice if we could automate uh, some part of this, right? <clears throat> then we thought of about an approach where uh, we have some 3D objects and we see simple rendering, then some exemplar, uh, like the drone style and also some annotation uh, with some additional information. <clears throat> and we, we only have this for a few frames or usually it's just a single frame. Then we say we transfer the style to other setting like different lighting view and uh, to different object possible with different topology. <clears throat> we wanted to we want to do this right. Then if we look at the elements of painterly style, <clears throat> uh, we see that the strokes has information of orientation, uh, length, width, and colors. Right, the orientation is like a vector field. And the most interesting part is how to model this orientation. And look at some human drawings. We see that their lines are uh, aligned with the lighting, and there are all other lines aligned with curvature lines. And uh, there are interestingly some intermediate lines like here. And at, at, at first it looks like they are following the curvature lines, but uh, actually they are not. Uh, they are more close to the silhouette lines. So depending on the location, the hu human will draw, draw like draw the lines um, according to different features. So we wanted to learn this. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, so basically we want to reproduce the vector fields to uh, draw the strokes, right? So then um, so basically we want a way to to uh, represent vectors, uh, if we uh, recap how we could um, uh, uh, express a vector in a planar region, uh, basically we need to first prepare the basis vectors. Then uh, once we have basis vectors, we need weights. And by combining them linearly together, we can uh, make up a new vector, uh, this blue vector like this, right? By changing the weights, we can have different vectors. And of course, the weights can be negative, right? Then uh, for objects, we have usually have on a curved surface. So that means uh, we will have the basis vectors distributed spatially on the space. And at, at each location, uh, it, it's basically the same principle, right? You have the uh, weights, then you can combine the basis vector to together to form a new vector at each location, then you have a vector field. Or you could alternatively uh, build this as that uh, you had a set of basis vector fields, right? And uh, the basis vector fields we call canonical sections. And then uh, combined with weights, weights are just a scalar field. Then we do a linear combination, then you have a vector field. So this way you can generate new vector field. Right? And for our purpose, because we know that uh, the um, stroke orientation may depend on different factors like lighting, uh, geometry of view. So instead of just uh, preparing two basis vectors at the location, we say uh, we have an overdetermined basis. Like this example, instead of just having two basis vectors, we can have more basis vectors. And um, even if we have more ve basis vectors, um, they, the same principle applies, right? You can still have a set of weights, and then by linear combination, you can uh, generate a new vector, right? So it's, it's the same principle. So just uh, we have more basis vector fields or uh, chemical sections, and then combined with weights, we can produce a new vector field. Right? <clears throat> Then for our case, we say we prepare uh, illumination dependent, geometry dependent, and view dependent vector field, uh, chemical sections or basis vector fields. So for ins instance, like um, uh, if we have these inputs, like the geometry and the lighting, then we can compute the uh, gradient of the illumination and have a uh, vector field like this, right? Then we say, Let's take this as a candidate for the um, illumination-based uh, basis vector field, right? Then we also uh, prepare a 19-degree rotated version for that. 
then uh, for other geometry dependent ones and real dependent ones, we also use some other <clears throat> ways to uh, pre uh, determine the basis vector fields. Right? Then having these basis vector fields or conical sections, then uh, if we have weights, then we can combine them together to form a vector field. Then to have the weights, we say, on the other hand, we prepare, uh, I mean, we compute a set of scalar features. Then we say we want to run a map that maps these scalar features to the weights. Right, um, then something like this. Then combined together, uh, combined together, sorry, no, go back. <clears throat> then combined together, you can generate an a vector field. Then you can take the error between the example and the generated vector field. And then you say you, you kind of minimize this error to learn this map. Then once you have the learned map, um, for a different setting, you can compute the scalar features and use a map to compute weights. Then you can combine the weights with the uh, computed canonical sections, then have a new vector field. And here's some uh, 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 comparison of the regression results. Uh, if we have an zeroth order uh, model for the map, which means the weights are uh, location independent, uh, then uh, there's a big mismatch. So that means that the weights should indeed depend on the location, right? And then if we use a first order, which means the learning is just a linear regression and it can be done very easily, uh, we already have a nice uh, matchup, right? Then uh, once we have the um, vector field, uh, then we also apply some smoothing. Uh, to smooth out some artifacts. And for colors, uh, we could also do linear regression, but instead we use neighbor, nearest neighbor to have a more vivid um, distribution of colors. Then, uh, then we have some um, anchor points as the starting points for drawing strokes. And starting from these anchor points and following the vector fields, we start to draw the strokes, right? Then um, by predetermining the anchor points, then we have this um, uh, time coherence, temporal coherency. And uh, you can also have some random offsets to have a little variation in, in this um, uh, orientation, which is more close to human style. And then compared to some patch-based or image-based approach, um, you can see that our result is pretty stable and it also works for uh, the situation we, where you come to the backside of the object. And here are some results. Uh, here you see the example and uh, the annotation has some information about the orientation uh, seen in the example. And then here is the um, 3D reference rendering, the, the, the target state. So you can transfer this um, example, uh, the single image into this target situation and have the generated function. <clears throat> you can do this transfer between different uh, objects, right, like this. And uh, you can also handle uh, deforming objects like this. So you see that uh, the lighting uh, changes pretty uh, nicely. It, it follows this uh, reference rendering. And you see the style, there's a coherency between frames, right? And uh, also you have this color variation, very rich color variation. And it's very hard for a human artist to, re to create this sort of results. And you can do the transfer for different topology. And you can also apply transparency. And by combining them together, you have some um, overlaid uh, result with multiple uh, draw, drawing styles uh, on top with each other. And you can also apply the method, our method to this um, short um, clip from Sprite Flight create some animation like this. <clears throat> okay, 
So uh, today I have introduced um, some physically based modeling for complex fluids, like those we see in our daily life, like foods, and also um, how to learn the human um, drawing style, like to, to reproduce or to simulate the um, orientations of the shorts. I want to um, uh, thank my uh, collaborators and uh, my friends helped uh, these works and funding agencies. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yue. Uh, do you have any questions from the network? I will, I will first ask you ask uh, one question, and uh, it's about uh, the latest work uh, you just uh, mentioned. And uh, uh, your work shows a uh, great consistency between frames. Uh, do you think, uh, or, or I should say, uh, which part of the uh, network input uh, do you think contributes most to this consistency? Uh, I think the consistency uh, Maybe I would say the consistency comes from our uh, smoothing because we apply a uh, vector field smoothing, both spatially and temporary. So this basically guarantees the smoothness. Uh, but I think even without um, smoothing, although there is some little flickering, um, sometimes there are little flickering, uh, the learned model is um, kind of already have some temporal coherency. I think it's because both the uh, basis vector fields and uh, features um, changes smoothly uh, over time. I think maybe that's the reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our model is a linear model. So yeah, it is stable. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive. Uh, okay, let me ask another question about your second work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I. I'm curious whether the uh, the shear uh, uh, well the the viscosity blending effect mm -hmm. uh, is effective on uh, a, a wider range of materials, such as if I mix water with mm -hmm. honey, will will they show the similar effect? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's a I think that's a very good question. I think. What and honey are both uh, Newtonian fluids, so it's basically uh, they only have a single viscosity parameter, right? So then yeah. I think the question is whether that viscosity parameter uh, can be blended linearly. Uh, actually, we haven't tested that uh, because um, water is very hard to measure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, it, yeah, the viscosity is so low, so it's very hard to measure. But, but I think that's a very interesting question. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, it seems that uh, there's no net, no questions from the network. Okay, let's thank again. Thank, thank Professor Yura for his fa uh, fabulous talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.